In the Name of Overhead Athletics podcast, where we cover rehabilitation, biomechanics, human movement, and optimizing human performance. Hey, welcome back to Overhead Athletics. I'm Dr. Max Wardell, and today we're going to talk about some of the research that's come out in 2022, specifically around throwing mechanics and accuracy, as well as rehabilitation. We've had some interesting studies come out in January, and we'd like to do some more videos on research reviews if you guys are interested. So if you are, let me know in the comment section, hit the thumbs up on this video, and we're just going to roll through a few studies here. We've also had some studies come out. We won't cover everything that's come out um, thus far. In January 2022, but we'll cover some of the most interesting stuff. In that vein, I would like to, I'd really like to keep doing this stuff. So if you guys are interested, um, let me know. And basically what we've done here is just compiled four different studies we'll talk about and some of the key points. One of the most interesting ones was uh, pitching mechanics and the relationship to accuracy in professional baseball pitchers. This was a study that just came out. And one of the interesting things that they did was they looked at biomechanical sequences of the throw and then correlated that to accuracy profiles for these athletes. So one of the most interesting things that I noticed here was higher velocity players, players that threw at a higher level or uniquely higher level had increased accuracy as well as decreased arm kinetics. Basically, their accuracy increased as they increased their level, but the stress on their arm actually went down. So that's something very interesting because we talk about how as you throw faster, stress or torque at the shoulder and the elbow go up. It's not always the case. It depends on how you move your body. And so what we're seeing in these higher level throwers is that they're not only having better performance and throwing harder, throwing more accurate, but they're also showing less arm stress as a result of moving better overall. And that, that comes back to one of our core principles, which we've talked about. And it's really something that we've kind of looked at from Franz Bosch, who's from Europe. And basically Franz Bosch works in the Scandinavian countries, I believe Holland, but I may be incorrect there, but he works with athletes of different team sports and when he talks about analyzing biomechanics he talks about a principle called minimum jerk basically what that means is you want small impulse you don't want quick change of direction with jerky movement at a high intensity or high velocity with a lot of load because that's what results in injury because tissues can't tolerate quick changes in torque and load and so what we see in more refined athletes or athletes with more refined skills is that they can move through the throw or move through their skill with a more fl fluid motion. There's more fluidity in how they move. And that's one thing we notice at higher, higher velocity throwers. The other thing that was interesting is they were able to correlate some mechanical attributes to accuracy in these throws, most notably as landing leg flexion increased. So the more flexion you had when your foot hit the ground, worse accuracy you had. So if your knee was really flexed when you landed, you didn't throw as accurately as those guys with a little bit more knee extension when they landed. And we've seen this argument many times online that mechanics don't matter for accuracy. I really like Dustin Peace. I had him on my podcast, but he always says mechanics don't, don't matter for accuracy. He's right to an extent because there is an ability to be able to throw accurately with obscure or inefficient mechanics, but the more mechanically efficient you are, the less you fatigue as a result of operating at the same intensity, the more you're gonna be able to throw for a better strike percentage for a long, prolonged period of time. But also, the more moving parts you have, the more things that you have to control. So the more that you can simplify the movement, the easier it is to complete. The easier it is to complete, the more that we can control our out outcome. Um, so that's how I would counter that. And what we see here is an interesting study where they showed that, hey, some mechanical attributes do correlate with decreased or less velocity. And there's a lot to that. Um, you could say that, hey, these guys with lower velocity, worse mechanics, they're just not as practiced. But that's not always necessarily the case. Another interesting study that came out, elbow varus torque and ball velocity associations in high school and professional pitchers with increased sagittal plane trunk tilt. This was by uh, Manzi and colleagues there. And basically what we're looking at is for every 10 degrees of sagittal plane trunk tilt forward, so hip flexion as the chest comes forward into release point, so looking at release point, 
for every 10 degrees, we're looking at approximately a mile per hour of ball speed. So if you're straight vertical versus 35 degrees forward, that's potentially 3.5 miles per hour that you're losing out on because you're so vertical, not to mention the added loads to the shoulder and the elbow that are a result of that. So that was another interesting one. Differences in shoulder internal rotation strength between baseball players with UCL reconstruction and healthy controls. So looking at these guys that have had a reconstruction of their ulnar collateral ligament Tommy John surgery compared to athletes that are healthy and we're looking at their internal rotation and this was by uh, Kennedy uh, et al. And what we've seen is that athletes who threw for a period of time will either develop attenuation of a ligament, attenuation of a muscle, tendon, whatever it is as a result of poor mechanical efficiency and then they've gone into a rehabilitation protocol after a surgery or after this injury, and then usually they return back to throwing in the same way they did before their injury. So that's one aspect that we can correct, but then we also need to think, were they weak that contributed to that injury, or are they weak as a result of being at a rested state or not being able to train internal rotation. So if you have an elbow injury, and I've had a torn UCL, if you have a torn UCL, you know that you can't apply this backward, outward bending motion, this valgus motion. And if you can't do that in rehabilitation because you're trying to protect the elbow, you're gonna lose out on internal rotation strengthening because how do you strengthen internal rotation other than by internally rotating? And if you're gonna work on internal rotation, you know that you're gonna to have to stress that elbow and valgus. So a lot of times we're avoiding that in rehabilitation. What we're looking at with this study, which looks at internal rotation strength, is that maybe we need to program more and be a little bit more controlled in our risk and say, we're gonna take a little bit of risk or we're gonna apply a little load to the elbow and train internal rotation strength so when these guys go back to throwing that they can control external rotation as they go down the mound because if they can't control this if like if they go into throw and they can't control that external rotation because their internal rotators are weak then they're going to be likely or at an increased risk for another injury. So they have to be able to control external rotation with the internal rotators. And that means that we have to train that in rehabilitation. So whether they were weak prior to the injury or they're a weak as a result of we avoid that training in rehabilitation, regardless, we gotta start implementing that and we gotta be very strategic about how we do that. So I wanna put out some videos here soon on, on how we can start to train that internal rotation strength safely in someone who can't tolerate valgus. And that's done by pre-positioning the elbow and a bunch of different things. Another really interesting one, because I hear this all the time, is the contribution of posterior capsule hypertrophy to soft tissue glenohumeral internal rotation deficit in healthy pitchers by Paul et al. We've seen this narrative played out a bunch of times. Originally it was internal rotation is lost as a result of posterior capsule hypertrophy, thickening, and stiffening. Okay, so that was our original, our original theory. And as new research came out that showed that's not always the case, a lot of times the posterior capsule doesn't have thickening or stiffening, and actually it's the, in, it's the external rotators, the teres minor specifically, that gets altered in its penation angle or the structure of it alters and it gets stiffer and tighter, and it's soft tissue in nature. Then now we've had individuals come out and say, never is it posterior capsule tightness, or, or they attempt to do a test right here in this position and say, oh, well, it shifts posteriorly. You know, I can get good translation of the humeral head posteriorly, therefore there's no capsule or stiffness or tightness. What, what we know is if you test the, el the shoulder here with this angle, that's very different than internally rotated, maximal protraction up in the scapular plane in a lot of flexion. So in a lot of elevation up in this position, because now you're not tensing the posterior capsule, you're now tensing the inferior posterior capsule, more of the inferior capsule, but the posterior aspect of it, which is different than what you're doing here. And that's because of how you tension the capsule during the throw versus what's tensioned here. If you just drive posterior, great. But the posterior capsule only really resists internal rotation, primarily in this position. It's really, as you go up, up inferior capsules being lengthened, inferior posterior capsule there. So it's more about the inferior posterior capsule. And so you've, you've seen a lot of people that have gone off and spouted that 
it's never the capsule, it's always the soft tissue. And that's simply not true. And you can do that through a few different ways that you can assess it. And I put out a video before on how to assess internal rotation in a pitcher and how to use contract relax, how to use specific positioning to look at internal rotation and then glide the, the shoulder and see how it glides compared to the other side. And you can be very specific with that. And what this, this study showed was that in college and pro pitchers, posterior capsule thickness was associated with GERD. So the posterior capsule is thickening. Now, what does that mean for us? And I'll, and I'll quote them here. As posterior capsule hypertrophied, soft tissue GERD moderately increased. And this is a point that I'm making in the book that, that we're writing here. But basically, these things never occur in isolation. Posterior capsule tightness or stiffness doesn't occur in isolation of soft tissue stiffness. You're always going to have both. If you have soft tissue stiffness for a long enough period of time, the capsule is going to stiffen as a result because you're never accessing that range of motion. So what we're seeing in our more mature pitchers, our college and professional pitchers, is that they are having some posterior capsule involvement along with soft tissue involvement in their glenohumeral internal rotation deficit. So what do, we, what do we take from that as clinicians? We need to assess the capsule in internal rotation, in elevation, in a posterior inferior direction, and then take them to the same place on the other side and assess that. If you have more glide in that position here, that should tell you that you're dealing with a little bit of a, a joint-related or capsule-related restriction as well. If you don't have any asymmetry in glide, and you can use contract or relax to increase the range of motion into internal rotation, that tells you it's probably not capsular in nature. So what do we take? I would say 75% of the time you're dealing with people that have more soft tissue restriction, but there is a percentage of the time where you're dealing with capsular restriction, particularly if you work with professional and collegiate athletes. And if you just assess them out in this open pack position, or in this position here with no amount of rotational preference, you're not going to you're not going to gleam um, uh, the type of benefits or the the exact information that you want. You're not you're not going to get the information that you're you're curious about. You're going to get whether the posterior capsule is tight, but it's not really the posterior capsule that we're concerned with. It's the inferior component of the posterior capsule. So it's just something to consider: is that there is capsular involvement, despite what you may have heard online. There's always capsular involvement when you have soft tissue involvement, especially in your more mature athletes who have had restrictions or deficits for a prolonged period of time. And I'm happy to debate on that as well. So if you have any questions, drop them in the comment section. I thought this was some of the most interesting studies or, or things that we could get the most out of. There's there's some others as well. Ryan Croton from uh, armcare.com, Louisiana Tech. He, he had a study with some other people that came out looking at stride length, alteration. I think that was a good one to take a peek at as well. But these are the ones I really wanted to cover. So synopsis here, internal rotation is weak and our guys that are coming back from Tommy John. Mechanics do matter for accuracy. And as you become a more skilled pitcher, you not only become more accurate, but if you're doing it the right way and you're becoming more fluid in your movement, you can decrease the stress on your arm. And then every 10 degrees forward that you get at release point could potentially be a mile per hour, depending on how you do it. And then lastly, whenever you're dealing with internal rotation deficit, you have to be very specific in how you assess the capsule because it often is capsular in nature. And that's always a component of it. So nice little study we see here showing some of that. And, you know, like I said, I'm happy to debate that. I am of the camp to believe that about 70, 75% of the individuals who come in, depending on what population you work with, are probably not going to have posterior capsule or inferior capsule restriction. A big component of the restriction, especially if you're working with higher level athletes. If you like this video, let us know in the comment section below because I would like to do more research, videos like this, give the synopsis from my perspective and go through some of this stuff. Let me know, hit the thumbs up if you liked the video, subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Two videos a week coming at you. We'll see you then.